Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation, Preserving Your Family Papers and Photographs. Tonight, we're joined by Sarah Headland from the Montgomery History Speakers Bureau. Sarah is the archivist and librarian for Montgomery History's Jane C. Sween Research Library and Special Collections. Tonight, she'll be focusing on proper storage and conservation techniques you can do at home, as well as providing advice on when to call a professional. Please remain muted during the presentation and feel free to send your questions to everyone in the chat so Sarah can answer them at the end during the Q&A and I'll be sure to um, let her know what those questions are. If you enjoy tonight's event, please be sure to check out our website, poolsvilleseniors.org and consider uh, joining us for some future events. We have um, next Tuesday, music in the afternoon and bridge and other games. So without further delay, Sarah, you can begin. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming out uh, tonight uh, for this presentation. Uh, and I assume you're all here because you have some stuff uh, that needs help <laughs> in various ways. Um, I hear a lot of people say, you know, I feel overwhelmed um, or I don't know where to start. Um, you know, you need to like do something with this stuff, uh, but you don't know like how to get going. So that, or maybe you have your stuff organized and stored, but you're wondering if you've done it right or if it's going to last. Um, so I'm going to warn you up front, um, a lot of my answers and advice tonight uh, is going to start with the standard archivist answer of it depends, <laughs> because a lot of things are very different from each other. Um, so you will hear that phrase quite a lot, probably. Um, and to that point, um, I'm going to cover you know quite a lot of ground here in a short amount of time. Um, and I'm probably not going to hit on everyone's particular special case. Um, so I'm always happy to answer those kind of some more specific to you questions um, afterwards, or you can always email me um, those as well. Um, and feel free to type things in the chat, like as you think of them, like during the presentation, um, so that you know you don't forget things uh, by the end. Oops, hold on. I'm having a block on my screen share advance here, and I can't remember why that happens. There we go. Go back one. Okay, we're all good. So today I'm just going to give um, some general guidelines uh, to get us all thinking about um, preservation, conservation, and organization. Uh, so this is just kind of a general overview of the talk. Uh, we're going to briefly go over what kind of material we're talking about um, in today's discussion, and then we're going to do some background work in terms of thinking about your collections, um, how and why that you want them saved. Uh, we're going to cover some basic um, archival terms that will help you make decisions about um, some of your organizational uh, schemes. And uh, we'll also talk about assessing some of your materials. Um, are they healthy things? Do they need help? Um, and or are they somewhere in between? Uh, we'll go over the types of materials you should be using and where you should be storing things. Uh, we'll cover some frequently asked questions and then we'll get into the best ways to store some of the some specific types of materials, um, papers and documents versus photographs or scrapbooks or books. Um, and like I said, we will get to questions at the end. So what kind of stuff are we talking about here? Um, so family papers, as we call it in um, archival world can be a pretty broad term, uh, but generally it means um, like everything made of paper. Uh, literally, and um, the things that tell a part of the story of your family members. So this can include any of the following things um, from any era, um, you know, letters and cards, um, school papers, uh, anything from reports or uh, report cards from when you're younger, uh, legal papers. A lot of times people have like wills and deeds and um, stuff from previous generations who had purchased property and have records of those purchases. Um, of course, photographs, we all have tons of photographs um, in various many different ways. 
Um, sometimes people have diaries or scrapbooks um, that they've created or that their relatives have created. Um, lots of people have newspaper clippings. This is a big one uh, that people of previous generations particularly like to save. Um, and then occasionally like souvenir kind of stuff, ticket stubs and programs and brochures and things like that. So all of that kind of stuff kind of falls in these categories. Um, just to note the thing, there are things that I will not be covering, um, but may be closely related to your family stuff. So those would be things like military stuff, like insignia, dog tags, things like that, coins, jewelry, um, political buttons, clothing pieces, like gloves and hats and things like that. That stuff can kind of be connected to your family, but it's going to have specific storage needs that I'm not going to get into because, um, that's, uh, that's outside of the realm of paper, which is mostly my, my realm of expertise. So before you start um, trying to figure out what to do, it's a good idea to have some basic goals in mind. So are you doing this for posterity? Are you saving this stuff for uh, children, grandchildren, future generations? Um, are you doing it for research? Sometimes people want to, you know, do genealogy and they want to sort through their family things to get a start on that. Um, or is it for a special occasion? A lot of times people start digging into the family archives when they have an anniversary coming up or a big family reunion or things like that, and they want to gather some stuff together. Um, so when you answer those kind of questions, um, it might influence the kind of decisions you make in terms of what you keep and how you store it. Um, so can it help be helpful sometimes to have a clear goal in mind um, for what you're doing. And you should also consider um, within the material itself, what is actually important to save. So um, some people think archivists are like, like hoarders, like we just save everything, you know, but we're actually the opposite. We, um, we are all about saving what's important and what's valuable and not just saving it all for the sake of saving it. Um, so we call that a process appraisal, um, and that's deciding what to save and why. Um, so we're, we're making that decision not just because it was old or because it was mom's, um, but be, for another reason. So all of these questions can bring you um, to more clarity about how to proceed with this stuff. So to that point, we're gonna, we just talked about appraisal, which is an, an archival term. We're gonna talk about a couple more um, when you're thinking about an organization system. So our guiding principle as archivists is called in the French, respect des fonds. And that's the fond, not uh, the fonds. Um, the collection of material um, that was built by one person, so this is the theory, um, should be kept together for context of understanding both the material and the person um, or organization or, or family um, uh, who collected it. So I read this great example. This is not my invention, but um, if you imagine you have two grandmothers who both kept recipe books, right? One grandmother kept a box of cards um, in order of like traditional dishes and each holiday celebrated and that kind of thing. And the other grandmother kept like a three ring binder of recipes um, with stuff pinned in and, and all in between and your aunts like added their own stuff to it. Um, but they're all in alphabetical order with an index. So now as the recipient, as the you know person inheriting all of these recipes from your two grandmothers, you might be tempted to arrange them all together as recipes, like family recipes. Um, and reordered them so they're more easy to find um, for a modern family cook. But if you do that, you've lost all the context and connection to those particular women. Um, the connection to religion on the one hand, your grandmother stored those recipes in order of holidays on purpose because that was part of the culture of that family. Um, and then there's the mixing of the generations on the other side. You've got your auntie's stuff mixed in with your grandmother's stuff. And that's also an important sort of history to maintain. Um, so the point is that each woman sort of expressed her, some of her personality and the way that she kept the recipes. And that information is sometimes as important to retain, sometimes more important um, than the actual recipes themselves. So that's the concept of respect they found, like connecting it to the person as well as just having the stuff. 
So as the Fonz is saying their context matters. So um, understanding the Fonz uh, relates to two, um, two additional ideas, provenance and original order. So provenance is about making sure that the origin of the material is kept with it. So if you know that that recipe book was Nana Rota's, but it doesn't say that anywhere, um, make sure you add that information to that book because someone else inheriting that book might not have that information available to them. If Nana gave the book to Aunt Carla, who also used it and added to it for a couple of decades before it came to you, note that chain of ownership. You know, it was, it was Grandma Nana's and then it was Uncle Carla, Aunt, Aunt Carla's. And again, that affects this context of the object. So that's the provenance, the chain of ownership can be important. Um, and then the other side, original order, relates to that decision to keep those recipe cards in the order that she did, you know, when we're talking about the box of recipes and holiday order. Um, so in that case, the original order is really important because it talks, it discusses how those were kept. However, original order can go both ways. Sometimes it's super important and sometimes it just doesn't matter anymore. So for example, if your grandfather kept all the, the wartime letters he received from grandmother, he kept in a box and then they were under the bed and then they were in a drawer and then they're dumped all over the place. They're all out of order. And you know, now they're in a box in some kind of order, but they're not in original order anymore. You know, and it doesn't really make sense to keep them in the order they're in in that case because the original order or the original way he kept them is lost anyway. So um, so you have to sort of weigh these things and consider them um, before you start pulling collections of papers apart um, in a frenzy to organize, you know, just kind of like think about it a little bit. So now that you've thought about these bigger pictures, this all this esoteric stuff um, and what you're gonna save and how to keep it in a context that has a meaning to your family members. Um, so now you need to determine how much there is and also what condition it's in. So often we come across this stuff that we've inherited or we've had in our house for a long time and maybe they haven't been stored so well through the years. Um, you know, no judgment, but sometimes they've been in the attic or the basement or the garage. Um, they've been crumpled or folded or rolled up or some critters got in the box. Lots of things can happen, right? So we're gonna go over some red flags to look out for when it comes to like the general health of your, um, of your paper stuff. So, one of the most common problems I see is with newspapers or with news clippings mixed in with other papers. So uh, newspaper is the worst, cheapest paper ever. It was made to be thrown away the next day. It was never made to last. It is, uh, has a lot of pulp in it, which makes it very acidic and it has a lot of lignin in it, um, which degrades pretty quickly and discolors not only the newspaper itself, but as you can see from the photo example there, it will stain anything it touches. Um, so, and it also becomes very brittle and crumbly and kind of like leaves little residue and all your stuff. So we'll discuss later, like how to store newspaper items safely. So, um, so that it doesn't damage other things in your collection. But the general takeaway is if you've got newspaper mixed in with stuff that is not good and needs to be changed immediately. Uh, another thing you'll see very often, a lot of times in books, more so than documents, um, is this thing called foxing. And this is another really common issue, um, has a lot to do with the composition and quality of the paper. A lot of people mistake this for mold, um, which it's not. And you can tell the difference mostly by the color. Foxing is usually sort of orangey, brownish color, and usually comes in as sort of like splotches um, or speckles rather than, you know, giant portions of the page. Um, we don't really know what causes it. Some people think it's like iron oxidizing in the paper or some kind of benign fungus or extra acid in the paper. but it's actually not that dangerous to other material, but it will get kind of worse on its own. Um, and it will definitely get worse with heat and humidity. So the important thing is to keep stuff that's doing this, just keep it cool and dry. So then we progress into the actual mold. This is what active mold looks like, black, multicolored, um, or like white chalk dust sometimes. And anything that looks like this, should be removed from your collection immediately um, because unlike foxing, it will spread and damage other things. Um, even if the stuff is healthy, this will spread to healthy stuff. 
Um, and unfortunately, the best thing to do with mold um, and the cheapest thing to do is just get rid of it. Um, it really doesn't do well on paper materials and it's very expensive and time consuming to remove it from paper materials. Um, if you really have something that needs to be salvaged, you can take that to a specialist, a paper conservator who can treat it um, and take it off. And it still has to be isolated from everything pretty much forever. Um, so in, this, in these photos, the bottom one is like, nope, that goes straight in the trash. We're not even touching that. The one above with the little picture, we could maybe salvage that at a conservator's if we really, really cared about it. Um, but you have to really be careful uh, with this stuff. Another thing we see a lot, especially on old books, is what's called red rot. Um, and so it's like that dust that comes off the cover of the book. Um, again, we're not really sure why some leathers do this and some don't, um, but there's really not much you can do about it. Um, all you can do is just wrap the book like in tissue um, and keep it separated from other things. Um, it'll, it'll keep happening, but you just have to keep it from spreading to your other stuff. And then uh, there are pests that can creep into things, even in the house. Um, so these are the most common types of pests. Um, silverfish are insects that love glue. So they will chomp into um, book bindings and also graze on paper. Like you can see the little lacy um, damage on the book um, pages there. Um, and then we also have what's called bookworms. Um, they're actually beetle larvae and they will make those little trails um, through books. And then stuff that's been left in places where mice can get at it, you'll find they like to eat paper as well. And they will also leave droppings, which of course is a health hazard. Um, so for this kind of pest damage, uh, for insect damage, you can freeze material to kill, kill off pests, but don't just chuck it in the freezer with your chicken or whatever. Um, you wanna consult a conservator on that um, to make sure there's no active um, damage and follow their recommendations. Um, most of the time, just kind of brushing it off carefully and rehousing it completely and throwing out the old box uh, will be sufficient. Um, most of the time, insect damage that I see is old and there's no longer actually bugs in the box anymore. They just, you know, ate and move on. Um, so for all this damage stuff, the things to remember are that poor storage conditions is what damages paper and makes damage to paper worse. So you want to store them properly, low humidity, low heat um, and not in an exposed environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what do we do about this? Um, I will tell you. So these are some of the general storage materials that you can use for storing um, important papers. Uh, we talked about that extra acid in newsprint that will cause um, discoloration. So the materials that we use for archival stuff is what's called acid-free. Um, and archival quality boxes um, that come in all sizes, like you can see here, um, and acid-free paper that you can use for interleaving and acid-free folders. Um, so these are all the types of materials that we use in, like when I use in my archives um, to store historical documents. Um, and we'll talk a little later on how to use all this specifically uh, with specific types of material. Um, but you can also get um, some more specialty supplies like um, photo sleeves and albums and some custom size boxes. Um, to, they have certain sizes for, you know, specifically made for newspapers or for, um, for other types of uh, paper and some flat files. And then also some Mylar sleeves for your more uh, fragile documents. So those storage, um, if attics and basements are bad, so where should we be storing it? Um, basically anywhere you are comfortable, your papers will be most comfortable. So um, main floor stuff, closets on interior walls are best so that we're not putting stuff against an exterior wall where it can get um, moisture from the outside. Um, and under the bed can work. Um, papers save the best you know, I mean, if you were going to have an archival storage room, it would be between 50 and 60 degrees, which is not ideal for people, but room temperature is just fine as long as the humidity doesn't get too high. Um, and then one quick note um, that uh, 
that cedar chests and mothballs are not good for paper um, because the oils and the wood and the camphor and the mothballs act as acid in the environment and will yellow the paper. And these nice plastic storage tubs that you can buy at Target, um, not the best decision either because those can, what we call off gas, um, they can release gases over time and cause acidity as well. So um, those things are great for clothing, not so good for paper. So remember the golden rule. Uh, location, location, location. <laughs> Put it in a good place um, and uh, keep it uh, dry and cool. So just a few common questions I get asked when talking about archival materials. So I talked about this acid-free materials and why they're important. Um, so in addition to the pH balance, you want to make sure your storage materials are lignin free as well. So sometimes you can see stuff at staples or whatever that says it's acid free, but it's actually not archival quality um, because it would still have some lignin in it. Um, so I will, I can send you, um, there are specific places you can order acid free materials from. Um, and generally what I do after these talks is if people request it, I can send you an email with like a list of links and things that, where you can find these materials. Um, basically with this, you're trying to stop any existing damage and then prevent any further damage. Um, gloves. So gloves have gone in and out of favor in the archival world over the last few decades. And um, museums are different because um, they're handling solid objects. Um, basically best practices right now currently advise that you do not need gloves to handle paper. In fact, it's probably better just to have clean hands because often gloves, especially the cotton ones that are pictured here, can kind of catch at the edges of paper and maybe tear it even more and things like that. Um, if you are going to use gloves, I would, I would suggest doing that with photographs if you want to, you know, handle them more easily without trying to stay at the edges so much and get your fingerprints off of them. But you should use um, what's called uh, nitrile gloves. And um, that kind of keeps the fingerprints from getting on everything. And you can use those with papers too if you feel like you need some protection there. Um, but generally just clean washed hands without lotion on, uh, minimize getting oil and dirt on things, um, and you, can, you don't really need the gloves so much. And the big question, which we will talk about tonight, <laughs> shouldn't I just digitize everything? Because the digitization is magic, right? Everything's just on the computer forever, and we don't even need the paper anymore. Um, so actually, <laughs> consider that when you scan things and you create PDFs and JPEGs and you create JPEGs, so I'm saying that word create, creating, right? You're creating a whole new collection of stuff that now needs to be preserved in its own way. So um, anybody remember WordPerfect or zip disks or floppy disks, right? Um, these are examples of pretty recent outdated digital storage. Um, and if you found stuff stored that way today, it would be difficult and sometimes even impossible to access it. So, you know, you think about papers, you put a bunch of papers in a box and keep it out of the attic, it's still going to be there in 100 years. But no one is going to be able to access your thumb drive in 100 years, no matter how precise you keep it right now. So you have to remember that digital files equals maintenance. Um, saving something digitally is not magic. It is another form of maintenance to keep up. You need to migrate it to a new computer, to a new storage system, to a new hard drive, um, to new platforms. And your children and your grandchildren will have to continue that process um, of migration as this technology continues to evolve. So my advice is yes, digitize things, but digitize them for a reason. Um, to share things with family that aren't local. That's a great reason to digitize uh, photographs or albums to share with your relatives online, create a printable memory book, you know, drop an image into a family tree. These are great uses for digital things. 
Um, and then to preserve things. We talked just a second ago about all the horrible things that can go wrong with papers and how they can be deteriorating. So a lot of times you can digitize you know, images of them. So you're sort of capturing them in that moment. And, you know, even if deterioration continues, you have, you know, captured that information. So be selective about what you choose to digitize and why. And then you have to make the plan for the storage, storing it in multiple places, backing it up, changing it, um, scheduling, checking on it, make sure that it's still okay over the years. So digitization maybe isn't that much magic. <laughs> um, it's a great thing, but it's not just an, a be all end all solution uh, to everything today. Okay, so now we're going to get into some of the specific things. Um, we're going to do some processing. So I'm going to start with letters. Um, pretty common thing that turns up in family papers. Um, and most of the time, if you're lucky, they've been stored as shown on the screen now, sort of uh, with their envelopes, probably still folded up inside of them. Um, so this is good news, but we want to make sure to keep that envelope. So I don't know if you've read old letters from your family, but a lot of times when you open up the letter, it'll say Tuesday on the top, or it'll say, you know, December 15 with no year. So if you lose that envelope, you may not have a date associated with that letter ever again. Um, and the where I'm getting the date off the envelope is on the cancel stamp. And sometimes it's not readable and whatever, but most of the time you can get a date from the envelope. So you wanna keep letters and envelopes together um, for that reason. So what you wanna do is remove the letter from the envelope, um, unfold it. And if the paper seems strong, you can you know, open it a bit be careful with folding it backwards and stuff like that, that can cause it to bend or crack. Um, so the best thing to do is open them all out and flatten them. And of course, keep them together with their envelopes and flatten them under heavy books for a couple of days to sort of relax the fold. Um, and then for storage, or even while you're flattening, you know, when you're unfolding and all that stuff, put it just a piece of paper, um, one of those acid-free things of paper, get a piece of acid-free paper, just put it in between each envelope and letter. So envelope, letter, paper, envelope, letter, paper, and then put that under some heavy stuff for a couple of days, flatten it out. And then you can put it in a, in a folder uh, labeled with the date range and, you know, maybe who's, who the correspondence is from. And then you can store that uh, either, uh, oh, there's the example of the interleaving there. Um, you can store that either upright in, in a, a, a box that has like a clamshell top, or you can store it um, in a flat file box where they're laying flat. And you can kind of decide based on your particular material what you think would be better. Um, so that's kind of the quick and dirty on letters. Document, other kinds of documents are pretty much the same. Um, you always want to flatten things if possible. Um, don't keep them folded or rolled. Um, and you can also slip them in um, a mylar sleeve. Um, I showed those earlier with the, um, some of the earlier stuff. So this document obviously is really you know torn and coming apart. So I just slipped actually an acid-free piece of paper behind it, even for extra um, stability. Um, some people get really overboard with mylar and put like every single thing in a mylar sleeve. You don't really have to do that. If it's if it's fine paper, um, it'll be fine just by itself with other papers in the folder. But if you have fragile things like this that could get caught up on other things and, and get, get um, ripped and things, you might wanna give it some extra protection with the mylar sleeve. Um, you also wanna always use, uh, sorry, always remove rubber bands um, because those are, they're gonna just get stiff and they will stick to things too. They're, I've run across terrible uh, things with rubber bands <laughs> in collections. Um, you also wanna remove paper clips um, if you can, uh, they, uh, especially if they're rusty, like this one is, you can't see it too well in the photo, but they'll leave like this little sort of, you can see that like a little rusty imprint on documents sometimes if they've been stored in not great places. Um, so you can either replace it with one of those plastic clips, or you can just, um, fold a piece of acid-free paper, like around it, sort of like a little sleeve, just to kind of keep that little set of papers together. 
Um, and then as with the letters, you can choose to store the documents upright in boxes or in flat files. Um, generally things like larger oversized things like diplomas or certificates do better flat um, so that they're not you know, sticking up and the clamshell comes down and could kind of fold them and stuff like that. So again, making that box decision based on the material you have and what's best for it. And we're back to clippings. So clippings. Uh, we talked about newsprint earlier um, and how much it can damage other paper um, while it's also rotting itself. Um, and so here's the thing. Newspaper clippings have what we call in the business informational value, um, but not much historical value being mass produced, right? So the newspaper was not a unique document. It wasn't a piece of paper that your ancestor wrote on with their own hand, and that's the only thing that exists. The newspaper is not a unique resource. The only thing that's important about whatever clipping you're keeping is the information printed on it. So the very best thing to do with clippings is to make what we call a preservation copy. Um, so we photocopy the clipping onto a piece of acid-free paper. Um, so you can have a new copy of the information that isn't going to damage the rest of your papers. Um, and then you can actually discard the original clipping because it doesn't have any historical value in and of itself. And we're talking about clippings here, not entire newspapers. I know some of you have attachments to like actual newspaper issues, which, you know, they make boxes for that and you can keep those separated from your other materials and that's totally fine. Um, but if you're really uncomfortable um, with that, with discarding, the next best thing to do uh, is to put them in between two pieces of acid-free paper. So you make a little newspaper sandwich, um, put the clipping in between two pieces of paper, um, and then you can keep them with other papers and the acid-free on either side will keep that from damaging things on either side of it. Um, and, you know, assess, do you really need this clipping? People clipped things out and sent them back and forth to each other all the time. And was it really that important to have a recipe for egg salad from 1952? You know, like maybe you just don't need to keep it and that's fine. I'm not gonna judge you for throwing it away, I promise. Um, so uh, yeah, and like I said, you can keep entire issues. Um, they make boxes for those. So that, that all works too. All right, so moving on to photographs. So photographs are trickier than papers because there are so many different types and formats. And um, so we're going to go over a couple of those. I need to like, it's getting dark out. Lord, can't see my paper anymore. Okay. Um, so here's some types of photos that might show up in your collections. Um, if your family has photos going back to the 19th century, they usually take three common forms. There's daguerreotypes and tintypes, which kind of look like this, uh, often in little booklets or, or closed things. Um, and then later in the 19th century, they created these cabinet cards where they sort of pasted the photo onto a card. Um, these are actually pretty stable, honestly. Um, they, uh, as long as they're stored properly, this stuff is, is gonna be fine. Um, so you just uh, store them uh, in, whatever suits the size of them. A lot of times those cabinet cards can be really thick. Um, so you can kind of decide how many you have and, and what, what a good way to store them is. And I'll get into the different storage types in a second. Um, and then around the 20th century, we get into uh, you know black and white prints, which can be all over the place in size, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and then we get a mix of color prints coming out and I'll call so Polaroids came out, yikes. Um, and then by mid-century, there's lots of things like slides, and um, you'll also see like a lot of variation in how the color is retained. Um, a lot, I was just looking at my baby book in those seven, 1970s photos. They're like pink and orange. Like the color is like so sapped out of them. It's really sad. Um, and then lastly, there was like those um, just before digital, there was those cameras that took like three sizes of photos, including that landscape one, which doesn't fit in anything. Um, and then, of course, now we're we're kind of moving toward full digital with all photographs, right? So you have everybody has piles of SD cards and thumb drives and screens that look like this, iPhones full of photos. So um, there's all of that, and then there's also all different ways that they've been stored over the years, 
So some of you um, might have photos in all of these storage media in your house right now, right? I think I have photos in all of this right now. Um, sometimes they're loose in boxes, just kind of thrown in a box or stacked in a box and uh, you don't really, they're not really in a new order. Um, sometimes they're like rolled up if they're bigger photos. Um, sometimes they're in really, really bad albums. Do you remember these things? Um, and the, <laughs> the, the acetate sheet that peels back and either it's one or two things, either those photos are, are cemented on there for life or they're all falling out like everywhere. There's no glue left at all. Um, or sometimes you have um, albums like this where there's like this black paper and then they're like, you know, tucked into this. So, you know, all these different versions, how do we, you know, decide how to save all of this um, appropriately? Um, so when you're dealing with photos, one of the tricky things is, uh, well, all the tricky things are right here. Uh, the most important thing is to retain some of the identification um, that goes with them. We talked about provenance of Nana Rhoda's recipe book and making sure that someone in the future knows that's her recipe book. This goes 40 times for photos. There's nothing more frustrating than having a whole chunk of photos of family that you know are your family, but you have no idea who they are because grandma was the only one who knew and, and she's, she's no longer with us. So it's shocking how fast that information disappears from a family line. It can go in one generation. Um, so it's really important when you have photos to make sure that there is some kind of identification as much as possible that stays with them when you store them. Um, and we call that uh, metadata in the, in the new digital age. Um, and of course, like I just talked about, we have all these size differences and all these format differences. So we can't just buy one thing and put them all in the same thing. Um, and, and then lastly, we have this visual aspect of photos. You want to be able to look at them and enjoy them. Um, you, you don't want to put them, you know, in, in a place where you have to open this and then unwrap this and then do, you know, like we want to be able to like page through and enjoy them um, uh, because they're visually appealing. So remember what I said, the standard answer from archivists is it depends. Um, so if the photos are relatively stable and you don't want to disrupt what we just talked about, the metadata and informational integrity or visual appeal of the album, um, just, just leave it. I mean, so like, like this one, this is technically not ideal storage, but there's nothing wrong with these photos. They're doing fine. Um, what I did with this album was put some interleaving acid-free paper in between just so the photos weren't literally touching each other on either side because there's no um, film on this album. And then I store it in an acid-free box with some tissue surrounding it to keep it from bumping around and yeah, it'll be fine. It's probably going to be great. Um, so, you know, the other thing you can do with an album you're not sure is there's a time to digitize. There's a perfect chance to digitize, you know, capture all those photos in their current state. And then if they do start to deteriorate, then at least you have um, a digital copy of everything. Um, and then, so instead of maintenance option, we could also do the rehousing option. Um, right, so you can take photos out of those horrible acetate albums if you can get them out without ripping them to shreds. That's another case of like leaving it alone if that's better. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's not ideal, but you just leave it alone. If you can get them out, then great. Maybe house them in these kind of sleeves instead, which are acid free, and um, you can they got the three ring there, so you can put them in a in a three ring binder acid free box that will keep them um, in those in those sleeves, um, or you can just store them in folders in those sleeves. They don't have to go in an album. Um, I have a lot of collections where I've just put multiple um, sleeves in a folder, labeled the folder uh, with a date range or whatever. And a lot of times you can see on those sides, they have extra little pockets. So you can, you can write stuff like on a piece of paper and then slip into the pocket. So you don't have to write on the back of the photo itself. You can actually keep metadata with the photos uh, without damaging them. Um, which is uh, important. Uh, that's the uh, acid-free box you can put them in uh, that has the three ring binder thing. Um, and then lastly, if they aren't that visually appealing or if you've 
you know, digitize them all and you're accessing them that way instead of in an album, then you can also do sort of this quick and dirty, you know, put them in an acid-free envelope with metadata on the front, you know, and then just stack them in a box like this. This is the most space saving version. Um, and again, it depends on your collection and how you want to, how you want to keep it. Okay. And then scrapbooks. So um, scrapbooks are not new. <laughs> it was a big trend, uh, maybe still is. I don't know, I've kind of fallen out of it, but um, a lot of people still do, I think. Um, so there's different types. Uh, the old ones called what I call pretty things scrapbooks. This was very common at the turn of the century when they just cut things out of magazines or sometimes put little um, keepsakes in there and stuff. Um, so, this didn't really have like any information of value necessarily, but sometimes it's kind of fun to see what your ancestor thought was cool stuff, I guess, when they were uh, 12. And um, some more practical minded people sometimes kept their newspaper clippings in scrapbooks like this. Um, so this combines uh, two of our favorite things, glue and newsprint, yay. Um, so you can see when combined with other materials, this can be a problem in a scrapbook. You can see there's newsprint on the left that stained the letters on the right. Um, so what you can do with this kind of scrapbook, obviously you don't wanna take it apart because you, know, you, you wanna keep what they've created here. So you can just do a quick, simple interleaving of acid-free paper in there. It's not gonna take away the stains, but it's gonna prevent any further stains from happening. And then there's sort of like this multimedia thing, you know, where you have different types of papers and, and um, different types of stuff in there. The more modern scrapbooks sometimes have even three, to, partly three-dimensional stuff um, on the pages with stickers and markers and things like that. So this is going to be pretty similar to the photograph album kind of thing. Um, so, but with scrapbooks, we're like more likely not to like tear things apart and rehouse them individually. We're going to try to live and let live here um, because this is a composite item. You want to keep it. Um, and so here's another good moment for digitization. Um, again, capture what's on the pages while it's still okay and then store it the best you can. And then if it starts to deteriorate, at least you have the digital images. Um, and like I said, it's important to interleave with the paper. Um, so get paper that's big enough or cut it to size. Um, and you don't necessarily do every page, but if you have something that has the opportunity to um, stain things or, or um, damage things on the opposite page, then you wanna do that. Um, especially when you have newsprint involved. And then pretty much just wrapping it in tissue, getting a box that fits it. If it's too big of a box, kind of like, you know, tucking tissue in the side so it's not like shaking around in there when you pull it up and down. Um, and, uh, you can also just kind of support these albums from, you know, coming apart on the shelf. You want to store them flat, usually not upright like a book. Um, and you can either put them in a box or you can do sort of a halfway version of this where you sort of like wrap them with um, folders and tie them shut so they're not um, coming apart on the shelf. And lastly, just real quick, there's some books that kind of come with family collections sometimes. Um, which can include family Bibles, um, children's books that your grandparents had as kids that are kind of, you know, fragile and old. Um, older diaries or journals can sometimes need some special storage. We talked about recipe books. That's kind of another kind of book you can save. Um, so uh, there's a couple ways to store these special books, especially if they seem to need a little help, you know, a little support help. <laughs> Sometimes the cover's coming off a little bit or the binding's coming loose. Um, so like I said, with the scrapbooks, it's best to store those kind of books flat because if they're upright on the shelf, it's gonna put extra strain on the spine. Um, so you can get its own box. Um, they come in all different sizes. Um, and you can wrap it with tissue. You just want to make sure it doesn't fit too tight in the box because then if you try to get it back out and you have to sort of like dig at it with your fingers and stuff, you want to have a little extra room. So when you're measuring it, uh, make sure you give a little inch, at least an inch on either side, um, extra space. Plus for the tissue, you want to have some space for that too. Or for smaller books, you can um, uh, you get this scored cardboard like we did with the scrapbook and, and tie it shut there. And that'll just kind of keep the book, you know, lined up so it's not askew or getting, you know, um, coming apart at the, at the binding.
So that's kind of all the material specifics. Remember these things. If you remember one thing or three, um, you want to control the environment, first of all, right? Location matters, temperature matters, humidity matters. These are the, the, the most important thing to preserving papers. Um, remember that newspaper is no good. Get Do something about it. It's going to wreck everything. <laughs> and it's really not that important. So get that, you know, out of your collections and get everything into some nice, beautiful acid-free materials and they will stay in your family for uh, generations. So um, this is my contact information. And, um, and, and I don't know if we'll get to everyone's questions. A lot of times people have really specific questions to their particular collections. That could apply to a lot of people, other people too. So um, I think uh, Kelly was going to read what's come up in the chat. And um, if I don't get to your question, or if you have more questions that you don't want to ask tonight, you can always email me and I'm happy to, um, to help you with that at that time. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was really um, great presentation and very informative. So I'm sure people are eager to ask the questions. Um, the first question I have is, where is a good place to purchase specialty supplies? So like I said, um, if you wanna just jot down my email address, um, I can send you, it's easier for me to send links than to sort of describe <laughs> the websites. Um, there's basically two suppliers that I use at work for, for my official archival collections, Gaylord Archival and Hollinger um, Metal Edge Incorporated. Um, and those two places are pretty reliable for, for good archival supplies. Spent a little bit of delay uh, since the pandemic started, they've had a hard time keeping up, but um, but they, things do come. And then um, there's a place called Print File that I get a lot of this are uh, photo sleeves and and things like that. So um, yeah, just uh, just make sure you have my email, and I can send you the the link chunk <laughs> for all the stuff that I talked about. Okay. Uh, the next question would be. Um... Would plastic sleeves in a ring binder be okay for things like letters and clippings? Yeah, I think so. Um, letters, not so much. It depends on the size, I guess. Um, if you got like, you know, instead of having like the photo sleeve sizes, if you got, you know, you want to be careful with the plastic sleeves, though, that you get the archival quality ones, because the ones from like Office Depot or whatever, those those are like cheaper plastic and can off gas after a while. So um, you want to be careful with the quality that you get on those plastic sleeves. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've done that stuff and, and newspaper clippings will do fine. Um, they tend, newspaper tends to acidify more quickly when it's encapsulated. Um, so I mean, there's still a little airflow in there because it's like a pocket. So I guess it wouldn't be like completely encapsulated, but um, with the clippings, I could go either way with that. I still might recommend, um, you know, copying them instead of keeping the actual newsprint itself. Okay, well, it looks like you've answered that next question there. So I'll move on. Um, since everything today is digital, do you have any advice for taking preventative measures to preserve new things for future generations, like all the digital things that we're taking now? Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure I understand particularly. I, I don't know if you mean like um, digital photos particularly. Um, yeah, like... Um, everything that's, you know, we're taking our, all of our pictures on like iPhones and all the digital photos, are there things that maybe we should try to think about ahead of time to kind of prepare yeah. for our future, you know, grandchildren and <laughs> to have well, them? I would say, yeah, I would say the most important thing is to uh, curate that collection of photographs because, you know, we've gotten so lazy with photographs these days. We don't have to process them, we have to pay for processing and, and putting them on, I don't even remember the term, developing, there we go. We don't have to pay for developing film. So we just take a thousand photos of the same thing, right? And so, okay, fine, it doesn't matter. They're relatively small in the scheme of things, but if you multiply that by thousands and thousands of photos, 
your grandchildren don't want 30 photos of a sunset, right? Like you could maybe just save one. And um, so I think keeping up with that is the biggest challenge. I know that's my biggest challenge. My photos are a complete disaster. You know, I think you'd think I'd be like, so on top of that, but it's horrible. So it's really hard to keep up with it. Um, so I would say, you know, curate, like when you, you know, sort of do your dump into your computer or whatever, you know, like sort them by year or by event or however you want to sort them in folders on your computer, but, you know, weed it out as you go. Uh, so that what it gets saved is like the most important. Um, and then again, you know, like I said, with the digital stuff, it's the migration that's going to be the challenge. And I know I've lost entire batches of photographs to other computers, you know, like just whatever they didn't get transferred over, or there were photos on some SD card that got misplaced and now they're gone. And I mean, like, it's just really hard to stay on top of it. So I think, you know, that's the most important part of it, I guess. Okay. Um, the next question is, so what should you, is there anything you can do with old photos that you don't want anymore? Uh, is there anywhere that takes them for any particular reason? I mean, it depends on old. <laughs> what do you mean by old? Um, it also depends. Uh, just listen, I told you I was going to say it depends. Um, <laughs> it also depends on um, uh, if they have information on them. So I know, okay. So let me say, first of all, there's a lot of like antique dealers that just would sell old photos just because they're old and people would buy them. I'm talking about like those 19th century cabinet cards or whatever, you know, even if you don't have any information on them on to who it was or where it was taken or anything, sometimes people just want old stuff to either decorate with or do crafts with or whatever. So that's one option. Um, if you if you do know who's in your photos and it's a family that maybe i mean I, I would love it if some person came in and said oh i'm from the um you know magruder family and here is an entire collection of my great 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 grandfather's you know photos from montgomery county in the 19th century i mean for my historical organization that's really helpful and amazing and what something we would be looking for. So, you know, and everybody's stuff runs the gamut between, you know, historically relevant and, you know, completely um, irrelevant, I guess. Um, but don't discount that, you know, don't think just because it's your family that it's not important or no one's going to care about it. I mean, a lot of historical organizations want that kind of documentation of their area. Um, Sometimes, you know, if it's a particular family, sometimes if it's particular subject matter, like buildings or things like that, um, that can be attributed to a certain place, that can be really valuable historical information to some place, um, even if it's not particularly valuable to your specific family anymore. So, yeah, definitely consider that. Does the U.S. Archives take some things of historic value? Um, I, the National Archives, I assume, uh, that, um, it, de <laughs> it depends, um, <laughs> they've done uh, a really big push for World War II stuff in the last five years or so. I know I've done a couple of projects, um, sort of organizing people's stuff in preparation to send to the National Archives for their World War II project. Um, a lot of times they're looking for letters, um, and documentation of, you know, wartime correspondence um, or, you know, anything to do with military paperwork and things like that. Um, but yeah, it, it, you just have to contact a place and, and, and National Archives or any other place, right? All you can do is ask, you know, just contact someone and be like, hey, I have this stuff. I don't know if anyone would, you know, would be interested. And a lot of times, um, like if I get a request for something and I say, oh, that doesn't really fit our collecting mission, but you should contact this place because most of that stuff is from Frederick County or whatever, maybe they would be interested, you know, so often you'll get a recommendation for someplace else to try, even if they're not themselves interested. Oh, okay. What do you think about digital storage at places like Shutterfly? Um, so yeah, that can, that can work. I mean, any, any, 
I mean, I'm not against cloud storage because that's, um, you know, pretty stable and pretty consistent. The problem with specific sites is that, you know, I mean, again, with the, with the thumb drive, it's like, it seems like it's going to last forever, but, um, you know, Shutterfly might not be a company anymore in 10 years, you know, and then all your stuff is there. And um, if you did that and then forgot about it or did that and then your uh, children didn't know you did that or forgot about it, then those things can be lost before they can be reclaimed. So um, I would say it's a good sharing thing, um, but it's not long-term storage. Um, you wanna have them stored also somewhere else just to make sure. All right, um, one other question. Would the high school want any of their grandmother's 1889 high school diploma? Um, I, I assume you're talking about Poolsville probably. Um, I, I don't know that um, any of the, the schools have any kind of archival collections. I mean, that kind of stuff would more generally go to us if it's Montgomery County. Um, diplomas are not terribly historically valuable um, just on their own, uh, just because it's somebody's name on a piece of paper and it doesn't really say anything about that person that they graduated high school. I mean, you know, uh, and it doesn't really say anything about the school. Um, other than that they graduated people. So in terms of, you know, I'm thinking, you know, if you're talking about donation, I'm thinking about research value for someone else, right? Uh, a diploma could be really valuable to your particular family because it's your grandfather and it's you know, the school he went to. But in terms of general society, um, historical value, hmm, I mean, I'm not saying I wouldn't take it, but I might think about it a little bit because we have limited storage space. <laughs> um, but I don't think the schools really collect that kind of stuff themselves. Okay. Um, if anybody has any last questions, now would be a great time to post them in the chat. If you digitize the diploma and put it on Poolsville now and then, that might be a nice way to also share it. Yeah. All right, just gonna give it one more second for any last questions. It really seems like everybody really enjoyed the talk. Um, if anybody does have further questions, it looks like you can email Sarah at archive at montgomeryhistory.org. You can also feel free to always reach out to us at info at poolsvilleseniors.org. And I'd like to really say thank you to Sarah for her time and presenting to us tonight. And if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, again, you can consider joining our other upcoming events. You can find those on our website at poolswellseniors.org. Um, next Tuesday, we do have music in the afternoon from one to two, and we also have bridge and other games from two to four. So it's gonna be a great afternoon. And you can feel free to um, say thank you in the chat or leave at any time. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. This was wonderful. I'm going to um, end the recording.